All right, welcome everybody. I wanted to describe the efficiency of the simplex method. So the, to make a long story short, um, if you run the simplex method, always, all, almost always it runs extremely fast, but the worst case error bounds are quite bad. So if, if somebody creates an example that they are designing by hand to be hard for you, then they can make it exponentially hard for you. So in the worst case, the simplex method runs in exponential time, and that's exponential in the number of inputs, which is either the number of variables, n, or the number of uh, constraints, m. So let me describe why you should believe that the simplex method takes exponential time in the worst case. Klee and Minty were the first to prove this. And they proved so using uh, Klee Minty cubes. So all that those are are cubes, but they're deformed in certain ways so that the simplex method under various pivot rules is forced to visit every single vertex in the cube. Okay. So pretend we're optimizing in this direction, which is pointing straight up, all right? And then pretend our feasible region is the square in 2D, but I um, deform it to look like this trapezoid here, okay? Notice you could take one step and solve the optimization problem. Starting at the bottom left, take one step to the optimal vertex at the top. But there are also pivot rules where you improve a little bit, improve a little bit, and improve a little bit, and you traverse and you visit every single vertex, okay? In total, these cubes have an exponential number of vertices, two to the n vertices, where n is your dimension or number of variables. So for some poor choice of pivot rules, you could take an exponential number of steps. Same thing for the 3D cube. We're still optimizing in the vertical direction, so starting from this vertex, you could get to the optimum in a single step, okay? But you could also improve step-by-step by, step by traversing every other vertex along this cube, okay? And so there are pivot rules that would force you to pass along every single vertex, taking exponentially many steps. So these were not the original Klee Minty cubes. The original one is this one. It's a little bit harder to visualize, but it's still just a cube. It's a, still just a cube deformed, okay? This particular cube right here is deformed so that when you do Danzig's original pivot rule, which is always pivoting along the variable that has the largest coefficient in the current optimization function. When you pivot along that rule, you visit every single vertex before you finally get to the optimal vertex. So, you know, here's the actual linear program corresponding to this cube. My picture has been rotated, right? It's been rotated so that this direction that we're maximizing along has been rotated to be vertical. But one of the optional, optional homework problems will be to set up this linear program, put it in equational form, and then go through the seven pivot steps to see that those are seven pivot steps connecting you to all eight vertices of this cube. And you could consider other pivot rules that we described in the last video and very slow examples of a similar type have been constructed on, on any pivot rule you can think of on any non-random pivot rule. So you can, any non-random pivot rule that we know of, you can come up with a, a cube like this for which that pivot rule is very slow and visits essentially all of the vertices. Random pivot rules get around that. If you just choose a direction to pivot at random, then you're typically extremely fast. It is, it is pretty interesting. Um, how much complexity there is in cubes, right? You know, I'm a topologist, so I just think of a cube as a ball, and I think of a ball as a point, but there's so much complexity in these cubes, and people really worked for a long, long time, you know, to, to try to prove that the, the simplex algorithm 
um, was very fast. And then it was these counterexamples using cubes to show that the simplex algorithm with most choice of pivot rules can be, um, in the worst case, exponentially slow. Questions? Have there been examples that sort of for random pivot rules, the like expected time to solve is also very slow or does, uh, or is random just much harder to break? Yeah, I think random is much harder to break. So um, let me see. I'll end Lander with two positive results saying that Lander, sorry, saying that random is, um, is very fast. So let me just, let me just go into them now. So um, take a random linear program in equational form. I haven't defined that, but you have some random choice of coefficients, okay, on your linear program. So with high probability, which means like with probability tending to one, it requires only m squared um, pivot steps. Um, let's see, okay. And I haven't told you what my pivot rule is, but random pivot rules would work, would work fine here. This is really sort of any, any pivot rule would work fine here. Yeah, m is the number of constraints. Um, another result along those lines. So take an arbitrary linear program, okay? So your enemy can come and construct the worst linear program ever, okay? But then what you get to do is you get to add a small insignificant amount of random noise to the coefficients, okay? So just, just perturb the coefficients slightly. And then sort of regardless of what pivot rules you use, including random pivot rules, with high probability, um, the, the simplex algorithm will require only polynomial, polynomial, polynomially many pivot steps. Okay, so yeah, your, your question was different, Lander. Your question was about random pivot rules. But yeah, random pivot rules are, are quite fast. These are results about, I guess, random linear programs or arbitrary linear programs perturbed with random noise. Yeah, I think that's all I can say there. Good question. Other questions? Okay, so a goal that people have had, which nobody has ever attained, and I think a lot of people would guess is not possible, is to try to design a pivot rule and prove that the number of pivot steps is bounded by a polynomial in terms of your um, inputs, the number of variables or constraints. So no one's ever designed such a pivot rule um, I don't think anyone's proven it's impossible, but many people might guess it's impossible, but I'm not sure on the latest. Okay, let me describe some positive results. Positive results are, you know, hey, I just showed you up above in the worst case, the simplex algorithm is exponentially bad, but positive results are a reason why you shouldn't be pessimistic. All right, so Let's say I'm given an arbitrary linear program. I'm going to randomly order the variables. So instead of calling the variables, well, call the variables x1 to xn, but just you know, assign those labels at random. Okay. So sometimes your first variable is x1, sometimes your first variable is x17, etc. Then do the simplex algorithm where you use what's called Bland's rule for choosing the entering variable. Who cares what that is? And you use the lexicographic rule for choosing the leaving variable if you have multiple choices of leaving variable. And again, who really cares what that is? These are some rules that are designed to prevent cycling. But the, the theoretical result says that the expected number of um, pivot steps is bounded from above by this term on the right. It's exponential 
but it's exponential really in the square root of n instead of in terms of n, right? So this is better than you know, an exponential in terms of n or two to the n because the exponent is only in terms of the square root of n. Um, it's much worse than polynomial. What is this expectation over? You know, I was, I was given a fixed single arbitrary linear program that maybe your enemy handed you. This is, this is expectation is over all um, random orderings of variables. So even if your enemy gives you the worst problem ever, if you just randomly order the variables, then in expectation, you, you do pretty well. Okay. I want to go to an interesting rule now, which is called the clairvoyant pivot rule. And it's rule in quotes because it's not a rule you can implement. It's just a, a theoretical rule that a mathematician might uh, dream about. So, you know, one of the key difficulties of the, of the simplex method is you're at this point and you've computed this vertex of the polytope and you need to choose where you want to go next based only on what you see from this vertex. Okay. You don't have the global view of the polytope, right? It, it's too hard to compute. So you can't like look at this map of all the possible routes you could get to to take from your current location to get to the optimum, okay? You can only see this, this feasible region locally. The clairvoyant rule, yeah, go ahead. I've got a question. So on, the, on this um, previous result, sorry. Uh, so why does this expectation only depend on N? It seems like, like the number of constraints would also affect our running time. Um, so yeah. Why, why is that sort of not showing up here? That's a good question. I mean, and that, that seems to appear in all of these examples, like you have bounds often in terms of N or um, M, but not both. Um, let's see. So, I mean, I'm just sort of, uh, I don't really know for sure, but my guess is something like the following. We're assuming that the um, program is given to you in equational form where the, the, the rows are all linearly independent. So in particular, that implies that M is at most N. Okay. So, so that, that's probably the best answer. Okay, I mean, cool. Another thing I could say is that the rank of this matrix A is um, at most the minimum of M and N. So, um, you know, if, if some running time is really in terms of the rank of the matrix, you could bound that by either M or N. Yeah. Okay, thank you. But uh, yeah, I think, I think this is probably the, the answer I want to, uh, <laughs> I'm cheating. I'm like one of the students who gives three calculus answers and then asks the grader to choose the best one. So that's what I'm doing here. Okay, so the clairvoyant rule, pretend we can see the entire map of the feasible region and you can choose how you wanna pivot based on the entire polytope. So you're always gonna pivot in a way that allows you to take the shortest uh, number of steps. So the clairvoyant rule up above would allow you just to say, aha, obviously I just want to take one step to go from here to the optimal. Okay. So why is it even worth talking about the clairvoyant rule? Well, if you can't necessarily do that well with the clairvoyant rule, then certainly you can't do very well with any other rule because the clairvoyant rule is the strictly the best rule. It's just unimplementable. All right. So a positive result is that the clairvoyant rule needs at most n to the power one plus log n steps. Okay, so it almost looks like, well, yeah, it's, it's exponential, right? Because I have, I have n appearing in the exponent. 
it's exponential, but uh, it's not a bad exponential. Um, there's a famous conjecture in mathematics, which has been disproven after our book was written, but the Hirsch conjecture was the conjecture that the clairvoyant rule really only needed an order of n steps. So the Hirsch conjecture was that you could replace this with n to the power of one instead of one plus log n. So that conjecture can really be phrased in terms of, um, you don't need to phrase this in terms of the simplex method at all. The Hirsch conjecture, you could phrase in terms of just uh, polytopes and the underlying graphs and the diameters of those graphs, okay? So the Hirsch conjecture said, in any polytope with n vertices, if you look at the underlying graph of all the edges, that graph has diameter at most n, right? You could traverse from any vertex to any other in at most um, n steps. And sorry, n is not the number of vertices, n is the dimension that we're in, okay? So for an, any polytope in n-dimensional space, I might have you know, many, many vertices. If you're in n-dimensional space, the Hirsch conjecture was that you can get from any vertex to any other vertex in at most n steps. So that was disproven. If any of you wanted to learn more about this disproof in, in one of the homeworks, I'd be interested to learn more. The polynomial Hirsch conjecture is still open. And it says that if you have a polytope in n dimensional space, then the diameter of the um, graph between all the vertices is at most polynomial in n, the dimension of the space. Questions? And then I already described these last two results. In practice, the simplex method is impressively fast, even though in the worst case, it can be exponentially bad. All right, thanks for your time and attention. <laughs>